Welcome to the Epilepsy Foundation Alabama podcast. My name is Sarah Franklin, and we'd like to thank Greenwich Biosciences for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. With me today is Garland Stancil. He's Chief Communications Officer at Children's of Alabama, and he is also our Epilepsy Foundation Alabama Advisory Board Chair. So thank you, Garland, for being with us today. Sure, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. And just kind of give us people that are listening today an intro of who you are. All right. As as you said, I've been at Children's of Alabama now going on 27 years. So several roles that I've had throughout the years. But for most of that, I've been chief communications officer and responsible for all the communication internally and externally on behalf of children and families and all of our programs um, at Children's. And I know we're very proud of Children's Hospital in our state. It's uh, one of the larger hospitals in the nation, a pediatric hospital. So tell me a little bit more just about Children's Hospital. Too. Yeah, we've um, been around actually 109 years as of last month on June 17th. And it's founded in 1911 and started out as Holy Innocence Hospital for Children and then quickly after that became uh, the Children's Hospital. And we uh, are a 380 bed uh, total hospital, very busy, over uh, 650,000 to 700,000 outpatient visits a year and somewhere between 14,000, 15,000 inpatient admissions. And we see children from all over Alabama from every county, and then uh, typically between 45 to 46 other states in the United States every year, and somewhere between six to eight foreign countries. So a a lot of patients who come to us, and as you said, we're typically among the busiest children's hospitals in the country, have one of the busiest emergency rooms uh, under normal circumstances. And uh, we also, are the in the top five now largest facilities in the country by uh, square footage of our facility. So we have uh, over three million square feet dedicated solely to pediatric medicine. And talk a little bit about it. I know I enjoyed watching the recent hospital, the building project and expansion. It feels like yesterday, but I know it's been a few years. So yeah. about the Benjamin Russell campus. Yeah. So we um, we did add on in 2012, started started that addition in about 2009, had a capital campaign, and then the building opened in August of 2012. And uh, it's the Benjamin Russell Hospital for Children and the Russell family here in Alabama provide provided the, the primary funding for that building. And then we had other uh, organizations and individuals who who came into that as well to our a hundred million dollar capital campaign so it's a pretty big project for the state of Alabama and it was during the recession so it was one of the few building projects in the state that was uh, going on at that time and uh, it is also a lead certified building lead gold certified meaning that it's a, a green building and uh, energy efficient and all of the uh, ecological, practices used in building that building, and it was the first LEED certified uh, medical facility in the state. Great. And I know I was a public relations student at the University of Alabama, and that was I was there from 2006 to 2010. And when I was there, I remember my professors were saying, Children's Hospital, maybe you were coming to speak or someone from your team was coming to speak. And it was kind of Garland Stancil was the public relations professional that people were saying, "Okay, apply to be an intern at Children's. Learn from Garland. You were uh, the president of Alabama PRSA, I believe, shortly after I graduated. And so you've just always been someone that as a communicator and someone that has been watching public relations in our state that people learn from. So thank you for everything that you've done. And it's you know, crazy too. It's as I was learning up, up from you and about you um, during my years as a student in Alabama. I remember even uh, my mother-in-law now. Uh, she was saying, "Oh yeah, I know, I know Garland. He was uh, the drum major of my high school band." And so, even during your high school years, you've been a leader in our state for a long, long time. So um, it's crazy too how small Alabama is. Even you know, our paths were intertwining long before um, we even realized it. But right. um, and then. Talk to me about how your life, as we're here with the Epilepsy Podcast, Epilepsy Foundation Podcast, how has your life intersected with epilepsy? It it intersected really before I was born. Yeah. So uh, my mom has epilepsy, and she was diagnosed when she was 11 years old. They thought that it was um, brought on by a really hard lick to the head. She she was a tomboy as a child. She was climbing trees, and she fell out of a tree from pretty high 
um, uh, distance and hit her head, had a high fever, had uh, some convulsions and things. And uh, seizures really didn't start immediately, but when she went through puberty, uh, they started. Mm-hmm. And so uh, at about 11 and a half, and interestingly enough, she had a, a lot of trouble as a teenager and as a young woman in her 20s and 30s with seizures and, and having you know, tonic-clonic seizures that they called grand mal seizures then. And then she would have a lot of the auras uh, when I was a child. So, um, but then when she was uh, later in life in her 50s and went through menopause, the seizures almost stopped. So it, it seemed for her that they were very hormonal mm-hmm. related. Mm-hmm. And, and so onset of puberty, they started. And then when she went through menopause, it, it almost stopped. And so now she's been probably 18 years or more uh, seizure free. She sometimes still kind of has an aura, but, but, but no seizures. But part of my earliest memories as a child were my mom and having seizures. I can remember uh, when I was probably three and a half, four years old, and you've, you've heard me tell this story before that, that she had a seizure mm-hmm. and fell uh, in the bathroom and I can remember going in and wetting a washcloth and, and putting it across her head and holding her head in my lap. And, and she came to and saw me there. And uh, I have a younger brother and he was in a, a playpen and just crying and crying. I, I can just remember thinking, I wish he would be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> he kept crying. But um, uh, so that was an early memory. And so as, as I was a child and growing up, her seizures were part of our life. And She was in and out of UAB and urology and different um, uh, epileptologists trying to help her and get it under control. And eventually she was able to get it controlled with medication uh, for the most part. So um, so it's, you know, been a part of my life. And then I, uh, as a a person earlier in my career, after I came to, to children's, probably in the late 90s reached out uh, to Karen Rowland who happened to be the the executive director and I knew Karen and Karen had worked at Children's before and told her my mom's story and that I would like to get involved so that's when I first was involved with uh, the Epilepsy Foundation here in in Central Alabama. Yeah and talk about too just kind of the struggles that you've been watching and observing the struggles that families with epilepsy deal with, maybe your own family with your mom's struggle or other families, what kind of are the big challenges that you see? Yeah, I I think the challenges have remained constant from the standpoint of transportation is always a big challenge. So when my mom would, you know, uh, be in active seizures, then she couldn't drive Mm -hmm. for six months. And so that sometimes was a, a problem when you've got two little children and you're needing to do things. Now, we were lucky that we lived in a community that um, at the time was really safe and we could walk and we could walk to the grocery store or different stores and, and run errands for her. We had neighbors who would take us places if we needed to go. Then when I, I was older, probably 13, um, I started driving. <laughs> yeah. And and so we would drive and go places that, um, I don't know if that was much safer than um, <laughs> having a person with epilepsy drive, but, but we had to go and do things. And we were active in everything. You know, we played uh, baseball, we played basketball, we were in Cub Scouts, and we had church activities, and, and we both took piano. And so we had, you know, we were doing normal kid things. And, um, so sometimes she couldn't drive if she had been uh, having seizures, and so I would drive. And, and that probably uh, you know made her upset and feel isolated and sad that she couldn't necessarily get you close. Yes, yes. So as as her seizure activity improved, uh, the other challenge that many people with epilepsy have is just the emotional part of that and the depression that may go with it and that isolation that you mentioned. And in, in a lot of people have uh, more of the psychosocial issues that go along with that and, and thinking that everybody knows about their ep- epilepsy and everyone's judging them and treats them differently. Whether that's true or not, that's the feeling, the, the feeling and the impression. And so my mom had a lot of that, a lot of the emotional Um, challenges that went with that, a lot of the uh, kind of emotional baggage. And, um, you know, families responded things differently. My my dad thought if he did not deal with it and didn't talk about it, it would go away. Um, 
And so he, he was not really helpful to talk with her about that. So as the oldest child, I was many times the counselor and the person talking with her and, and trying to help her deal with her emotional issues. And for someone that's, you know, 12, 14, 16 year olds, you, you're not really equipped right. to do that well. So, um, so those were, those were challenges. And I feel like in talking to you, that's what led you to want to be involved, just to help and encourage other families with the so psychosocial aspect of it. Right. So right. the mental health aspect of right. isolation and depression that comes along a lot of times with epilepsy. Yes. And since you've been involved with Epilepsy Foundation in the Central Alabama affiliate and you've seen the involvement of the organization over the past few years, how, what have you learned about the foundation, how it actually helps people? Um, and yeah, just talk to me about the evolution of the foundation that, that you've seen. Right. And the, the, my first um, you know experience with the foundation in Central Alabama uh, we were an affiliate and we operated somewhat independently without a lot of, of the the National Epilepsy Foundation being involved. So um, I didn't know as much then about what they were doing at National, but I did know that here locally we were trying to look to help people um, with information and referral a great deal and, and emergency medicines, which, which we're still involved in, in doing that. Uh, but I didn't know as much at the time, and maybe it was not as active, uh, that Epilepsy Foundation nationally is um, involved in research and all of the research that is has helped and the, the new treatments that have been developed and new procedures that have been developed. So um, I know a lot more about that now uh, because of our uh, foundation here locally being a chapter and having gone to uh, a couple of the, um, you know, the national leadership trainings and hearing more about all of the research that's going on, uh, the work in, in relation to SUDEP and, the, you know, as far as diet and as far as different uh, surgical techniques. And we've been involved in those at Children's as well. So the physicians who are at Children's who are kind of almost employed by Children's and uh, UAB, uh, have been involved in that research and involved in those techniques. And I, um, I know that just probably four years ago, four and a half years ago, uh, we were looking at some surgical techniques that use the, the Rosa uh, robotics surgery and looking at how you could just, in, instead of doing a major surgery and, and opening uh, you know, the skull and, re and removing a large part of the brain, that they could do that surgery with the, the robotics and pinpoint with just a you know a little area and be able to um, essentially cauterize that area of the brain that is causing the that is causing the seizure activity and within hours certainly within 24 hours someone that maybe was having a hundred plus seizures a day uh, is having none. Mm -hmm. So incredible. just incredible the I think the advances in the last 20 years that have. Uh, have been made for people with epilepsy from a, a treatment surgical standpoint um, and, and still a lot of research and, and advancement being made. And I think, you know, since I started this role, I didn't know before I started here the pediatric epilepsy faculty or the nursing staff and now I've met them and they're so encouraging and on board with helping people get connected to the foundation through our kids crew and other activities. But talk to me too, just about you're familiar. You've been with the hospital for 25 years. Some of the faculty in the neurology department has been there that long. What are some of the strengths and talk to me just about the faculty, um, the neurology faculty at Children's. Right. Um, it, it really is a strength, I think, for the for the program and the people in Alabama with epilepsy, uh, that we have knowledgeable people. But uh, probably beyond the knowledge is their commitment and their passion for helping uh, those with epilepsy. And uh, one of the things that we are trying to focus on is uh, getting more faculty trained specifically in epileptology and being uh, specifically trained in pediatrics. So uh, a lot of people don't really um, realize that a neurologist is, is it is a specialist, but it, it is generalized specialty within neurology. Right. So it takes um, more training, longer training, more, more investment mm -hmm. from the person to become an epileptologist. 
and even more to specialize to be a pediatric epileptologist. Big word. So, yeah. Uh, but um, so there are fewer people who are looking to do that, who want to, after they've gone to school, as long as they have to just go that much more and that much more to get that training. So uh, I think um, we have a commitment at Children's and there's a commitment from UAB and certainly from, um, the, from the foundation mm -hmm. to see more people trained to benefit uh, children right. with, with epilepsy. Because if we can do whatever we can to minimize seizure activity as much as possible when a pediatric patient has epilepsy, then that causes less trouble in their adulthood. So. Right. Yeah, and I think even with the hospital expansion too, I remember our board talking about how um, the EMU was able to um, expand and have mm -hmm. more beds with the hospital expansion. So that right. further helps patients and pediatrics with epilepsy too. Yes, so. and we, we do have a pediatric uh, epilepsy monitoring unit, uh, which helps to be able to, to pinpoint mm -hmm. and to look for uh, individualized plans. And that, you know, a lot of times in, in education, we hear of IEPs and those individual education plans. But for uh, really any person with epilepsy, it is an individualized plan because not any person's brain is exactly the same. Their epilepsy is not exactly the same. I mean, there, there are some common factors, but uh, the way a person's body responds and what's happening with their particular brain mm -hmm. is, is a little different. So it takes an individualized plan to find out what works for with one person. Some of that may work with someone else, but it, it may not. It may be slightly different. Right. Right. And tell me too, when we're talking about projects that your team has been working on right now, there's the opportunity for the health and epilepsy specialty license plate. And a lot of times we get calls at our office or on social media about the current um, tag, when they'll get it. Talk to me about just from the beginning, what is the process to get the license plate approved and where we are today in that process? Yeah, it, it is a, uh, a long process, longer than we'd like for it to be. Uh, but uh, the state of Alabama has to approve a license plate and even before you um, can begin to promote it, you have to have the design, you have to apply to the state. Uh, there is a review board that looks at it. They look at uh, the charity or whatever the cause is that it's going for. They look at the design. You have to meet all their design criteria. Uh, they are only going to uh, approve a certain number of, of those specialty tags every year. So you're, you're competing for, for space. And uh, once you go before the, the review group and you gain approval, then things begin to work and you can start. And we just gained that approval earlier this year and launched uh, promoting uh, from Children's and along with the foundation that the tag is out there. But you have from the time you gain approval uh, one year to get a thousand uh, kind of pre-sales or pre-commits to for people to say, yeah, I, I want one of those tags. They have to provide their vehicle identification number and uh, send all that into the state to say that I've, I've pre-committed. And then uh, once you, the year is up, if you have a thousand or more, then they produce the tag at that point. So the earliest that we could have a tag uh, produced to help end epilepsy would be next spring, probably April, May or so. And then it's not like you run right out and get the tag at that moment. You wait until your tag comes up for renewal. So, uh, you know, mine's in September. So it would be September of next year would be the very earliest. Right. And if you don't get that um, thousand, uh, sometimes you get an extension, sometimes not. And um, you have to try again. Yeah. And I think, you know, anyone can visit epilepsyalabama.org slash tag and sign up. All we need is just your information. So right. like you said, the vehicle identification number and your first and last name. And right now we're about at the halfway mark. So we need anyone listening to this yes. podcast. If you live in the state of Alabama and you are passionate about epilepsy, funds going to epilepsy research, all you have to do is sign up. There are no additional costs at this time. You would just be responsible when your tag is up for renewal for your regular um, renewal costs, there's typically an extra, right, correct me if I'm wrong, $50 charge mm -hmm. to get a specialty tag, but a donor, an anonymous donor is covering the costs. So it is free to get this tag for the first year. Right. So please visit epilepsyalabama.org slash tag and sign up yourself as well as any other car tags in your household. So mom and dad or grandparents, cousins, 
uh, please sign up because we need everyone. Don't don't delay. Sign up today. It's kind of what we need you to do. And yes. the thing is that forty out of that fifty dollars, forty one twenty five of everyone uh, of the tags that sold will help epilepsy go directly to help. Uh, provide education and, and other resources for exactly. those with epilepsy. So, you know, even from this donor for the first thousand, uh, you know, we're talking about a significant amount of money in that first year, but then we hopefully would, would grow uh, those, that number. And in subsequent years, 4125 of every tag will come to help uh, those with epilepsy. Right. Well, and thank you to your team because I know you your team has done other specialty license plates in the past that have been successful. So you know the process and you know that time and the effort that it takes to make it a success. And we will do everything we can to help make sure the epilepsy tag gets approved too. And or that it's approved, but get the number right. of people signed up. And the thing that I think that's exciting about it from the epilepsy standpoint is as far as we know and what National uh, Foundation tells us, this will be the first uh, tag in any state in the country to benefit uh, those with epilepsy. So. Yes, Alabama leading the way. Yeah. So we need to yeah. make sure and get all 1,000 people signed up. Yes. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you, Garland, for agreeing to be our Foundation Advisory Board Chair when um, the chapter moved to Central Alabama. I know you are a leader in many ways across the nation, whether that's with PRSA, the Public Relations Society of America, at the hospital. And so you get asked to do a lot of things and you've been critical to our chapter success. And I could never have imagined, I think our conversation about my onset of epilepsy a little while ago, it was divine and leading to me to this position. I could have never imagined that. And I just thank you because I can't imagine yeah, just being in this role without you here. So thank you for everything you've done. It's been, been my pleasure. Thank you, Garland. Thank you. Again, we want to thank Greenwich Biosciences for sponsoring this podcast. If you're interested in also supporting the Epilepsy Foundation, visit www.give26.com and consider giving $26 for the one in 26 people that will develop epilepsy in their lives. My name is Amy Padgett, and I'm honored to be speaking to you virtually today on behalf of Greenwich Biosciences and our entire team. As a sponsor of these podcasts, Greenwich Biosciences is proud to partner with the Epilepsy Foundation for events like this to help people stay connected in this virtual environment. We are united in what we are trying to accomplish here today to raise epilepsy awareness, to have a positive effect on care, on research, and on the lives of those who are impacted by seizures. There are so many families who wake up every day to the reality of epilepsy. There are people listening to this right now who have been fighting against it their entire lives. And there are others who are not able to join us today. But as a community, we will never give up the hope that in one day we will overcome the challenges of living with this disease. This is what drives us. You may know us best as the company researching and delivering FDA-approved cannabinoid medicines to help address serious conditions, but also know that our focus is you. Patients and families are at the center of everything we do, and we strive to make a positive and meaningful difference in their lives, in your lives. Today and every day, we are proud to be here with you, virtually and in real life, to raise awareness, take action, and continue the fight to end epilepsy. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of this event.